We're back, Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, we've been out for a couple of weeks, so I want to give just a little bit of a recap. Is that okay? Church, are we here? Is that okay? Cool, let's do it. All right, Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra and Nehemiah are two books in our Bible, but really one book in the original. So this is one story from Ezra to Nehemiah. It's really one story, uh, one overarching story. And then even then, I wanna encourage us, as we come to the scriptures, we have to remember, we can't read just Nehemiah in light of Nehemiah. We can't read Ezra just in light of Ezra. We have to read scripture uh, through what it is, and that is just one piece in the overarching story of the Bible. So from Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation, this is God's story that he is telling, and so we have to read it as such. And so when we come to Nehemiah, we're really coming to just one angle, one aspect, one piece of the overarching story that points to Jesus. And so it is Two books in our Bible, one book in the original. But we pick up in Ezra, the Israelites are in captivity and they're returning from Babylon to Jerusalem. And uh, they get there and they start to rebuild, both as um, uh, construction-wise, as a city, but also as a people. Renewal as a community of people. And so they begin to rebuild. They rebuild the altar first and then they rebuild the temple And then Ezra comes and he's committed to teach the word of God to renew the community, not just the temple. And then Ezra ends in this kind of anticlimactic way in this great divorce because the men of Israel have married foreign women. And foreign women, not just, that's not just the, 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 the extent of it. It's foreign women who are part of religions that had child sacrifices and a bunch of bad stuff. And so this isn't a good thing for the people of Israel. Yet God doesn't love divorce. And so it's this weird climax, uh, anticlimactic event at the end of Ezra uh, that God didn't actually command them to do, but it's again, this this overcoming with rebuilding the temple and teaching people the word of God, but then this kind of not so great ending. And then we pick up in Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a cupbearer for the king of Persia, and he hears about the state of his people and the state of Jerusalem, and he finds favor with the king to leave and to lead his people to rebuild the wall specifically. So Nehemiah sets out to build the wall, and he, just like the other people, the main characters of Ezra and Nehemiah, they face opposition. And uh, I love the passage in Nehemiah chapter four, uh, kind of an overarching theme of Nehemiah. It's, 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 it says he has a weapon in one hand and a tool in the other. And so it's this whole idea of building and battling at the same time that we see throughout Nehemiah. But then... Uh, it, it, says that, it says that they overcome, right, 52 days, they rebuild the wall. Let's give it up for them. They rebuild the wall. Yeah, come on. They finish the wall, but then Nehemiah takes a turn at the end, which we'll get to in the coming weeks. And so what I want you to see, mostly from Ezra and Nehemiah, that there's this reoccurring theme throughout the whole story. Each leader's process and outcomes display this. It, it, it's kind of a mirroring pattern. Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Zerubbabel, they rebuild the temple, but you have people who are excited about it and people who are sad about it. People who are sad because they've seen what was and it's not the same and people excited about where they're headed. And then Ezra, you know, he's committed to teach the word of God, but then the people, um, the people disobey and then there's this ending that isn't the greatest ending. And then Nehemiah will see the same thing. And each leader comes up against some opposition. They overcome but in a strange way, not the, not the best way and definitely not the perfect way. And so today we pick up in Nehemiah chapter nine. I hope you're ready to read because we're reading the whole chapter, all 38 verses. So buckle up, buttercup, because we're doing this. Nehemiah chapter nine, verse one, let's go. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. Pause want to point out some, some commentary as we go because I really want us to understand the text. And so the first thing I want you to notice is, is the fasting and in sackcloth. And there's multiple reasons why we would fast, but, but the sackcloth, the fact that they're in that, it implies something very specific. It implies a sense of mourning, a sense of sorrow, a sense of sadness, a sense of grief. And so whenever you see this in the text, 
that's kind of the, the overall theme or feeling in this part of the text. And so we continue. Verse two, and the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins. Everybody say confessed. confessed. And the iniquities of their fathers, verse three, and they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession. Everybody say confession. confession. And worshiped the Lord their God. On the stairs of the Levites stood Jeshua, Benai, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Benai, Sherebiah, Benai, and Shen, I don't know. That one's a hard one. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Benai, Hashabaniah, uh, Sher, I promise I went to Bible college, you guys, okay? <laughs> Hadiah, Shebaniah, and Peth, yep, we're gonna just stop there, keep going. Said this, stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Verse six, you are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them. I want you to catch this theme as we continue reading. There's a huge pattern here in this first section. And the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, and the Perizzite and the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. And you have kept your promise, for you are righteous. And you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of this land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers and you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And you cast their pursuers into the depth as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud, you led them in the day and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. Verse 13, you came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. Pause. I wanna make note of this verse, verse 13. Because I think for me, when I read the scriptures and I see rule, the word rules or laws or commandments, I get a certain kind of perspective on it. Growing up in the church, you hear rules and you kind of have this bad connotation. I don't know about you, but, but, I, but I, I, growing up, kind of had this like, it, it's not about rules, it's about relationship. Or, you know, it's, it, we don't want to be about the rules because that's being a Pharisee and that's bad. And I would agree to that to an extent because I don't think we're supposed to be like Pharisees who are all about the rules and didn't have a relationship. But I want to read this again and give you a new frame of context for this verse with some emphasis in it, and I hope you catch it. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules, true laws, good statutes and commandments. Hear me, please. A, a punishing point the finger kind of God doesn't do that. This is a perfect example of the God that we serve, that he is gracious and loving so much so that I'm gonna give my people right laws and true laws and good rules. I mean, I want you to catch this because we can't, we can't lose sight of this. Like how good of a God to give us right and good and true things. And this is the truth that we have to remember in order for this to make sense is that the creator of life knows what's best for my life. And so when it comes to that, when it comes to rules from the creator of life who knows what's best for my life, man, these are good rules. And good commandments. He didn't give this book of the, the law book so that they could be punished and feel bad all the time. No, he gave it so that they could have the way, the key to live the best life. Because I'm, I'm God. I'm the creator of the universe. I know what's best. And so I want to help us make that switch to see what a good God to give us right rules, true laws, good commandments. All right, let's continue. Verse 14, 
And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and did not forsake them. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies, you in your great mercies did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart from them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. And you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every corner. So they took possession of the land of Sihon, king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven and you brought them into the land you told their fathers to enter and possess. So the descendants went in and possessed the land and you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hand which with their kings and the peoples of the land that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities in a rich land and took possession of houses full of all good things, sistered already hewn, vineyards, olive orchards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient. Catch the rhythm, catch the, rhythm the pattern here. Nevertheless, but they, God did all these things. He created the heavens and, and the seas and, and they part, he parted the Red Sea for us, but they... And their fathers acted presumptuously. Nevertheless, they were disobedient. There's this theme throughout this that I want you to catch is that God stayed true. But humans didn't. It's the narrative that we see throughout the whole story of the people of Israel. You see it over and over and over again. But really what I want you to catch is that it points to, it points to the bigger narrative of all of humanity. That God stays true to his people. We don't stay true to God always. And it's kind of encapsulated in in Romans chapter three, verse 23, where it says, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. All right, let's continue. Verse 26, nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Therefore you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. And in the time of their suffering, they cried out to you and you heard them from heaven. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemies. I want you to catch that. Verse 27, it says, you gave them into the hands of their enemies who made them suffer, but also heard their cry and saved them. Those are two drastically different things, both God. God gave the Israelite people, his people, into the hands of their enemies and then heard their cry and delivered them, both God. And what I want you to catch here and something we have to wrestle with because there's never a perfect answer for this, but the Lord gives and the Lord takes. And there's a tension that we don't see everything like God sees everything. And so I want you to know that this is, that's, that's a hard verse to read. He gave them into the hands of the enemies who made them suffer. But he also delivered them when they cried out to God. Both God. That's something that we as followers of Jesus need to wrestle with. Verse 29 
and you warned them in order to turn them back to your law, yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules, which if a person does them, he shall live by them, and he, they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are gracious and merciful God. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who keeps covenant. Why does God keep helping the Israelites even though they turn their back over and over again? Is because God is a covenant-keeping God. God keeps his word. God is true to his covenants, true to his people, true to what he's promised. He's a covenant-keeping God who keeps covenant and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us, upon our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people since the time of the kings of Assyria until this day. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully and we have acted wickedly. Our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them, even in their own kingdom and amid your great goodness that you gave them, and in the large and rich lands that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. Behold, we are slaves and its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please, and we are in great distress. Verse 38, because all of this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. Chapter 10, we're not going to dive into today, but want to kind of survey the chapter in the beginning of chapter 10, it's a, it's, it's a list of those who signed the covenant, renewing their pledge to follow God faithfully again, which is really what this whole section of Nehemiah is about. And then it goes into the content of the covenant, which are summed up in these three categories. Holiness in the family is number one. Purity in the family, not giving their daughters in marriage to foreign people. So it's connecting back to the end of Ezra where there was this great divorce. And so now they're committing to holiness in the family. Number two uh, that we see in chapter 10 is a regard for the Sabbath, honoring it, keeping it, resting in the fact that we are God's people and God has made a covenant with us so we can work from a place of rest and assurance. And then the last thing we see in chapter 10 is care for the temple, care for the house of God. It repeats, I don't know about you, but it's, it's, it's good to, to highlight re repeated phrase, repeated words in order to understand what the text is saying. And so it repeats eight times at the end of chapter 10, the phrase house of our God. And once it says the house of Yahweh, and it ends with this powerful statement in chapter 10, verse 39. It says, we will not neglect the house of God. We're not gonna get into this today, but may those three things be true of us. I wanna make a few observations, but before I do, let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. God, you give and you love and you give us breath. And so God, today, God, I thank you that your word is not just a dead old history book, but it's alive and well, sharper than any double-edged sword, discerning spirits, reading our mail. So God, help us. God, to take this and not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. I wanna make four observations today from the text. Nothing fancy, all simple, but all good reminders for us from Nehemiah chapter nine. The first one is this. Confession is the right response to revelations from God's word. Confession is the right response to revelation from God's word. Not shame, not condemnation, which would have been very easy for the people of Israel. They had turned their back to God over and over again. The, the, the phrase that catches my attention every time is that they threw the law behind their back. So they had reason to feel shame, condemnation, but that's not the right response to God's word. They read God's word aloud and they confessed their sins. And when we come to the word of God, it should cause, provoke confession, repentance. 
What's so great about the word of God and reading the word of God? I don't know about you. Think of, think of your favorite book. I, don't, I, would, I would guess to say that you've never read that book with the author sitting right beside you. But the doctrine of illumination, meaning that we need the Holy Spirit in order, in order to understand the word of God, implies that we are sitting next to the author, the spirit of God, as we read the word of God. So we have the author right next to us as we try to understand because we need assistance. And so we are sitting next to the spirit of God, the same spirit of God who came upon every writer and author of this book. And so we are sitting right next to him. And so when we read, we have that to come out and we can read it and then be convicted and confess as the right response to reading the word of God. And as I mentioned before, fasting and sackcloth, that specific garment that they would wear was this representation of deep mourning for what broke the heart of God. And I wanna ask today, as we are challenged by this, this concept of how they responded to the word of God, does your heart break when you break the heart of God? I think it's really easy for me to see in the world what breaks the heart of God. It's easy to recognize Ah, That breaks my heart because I know it breaks God's heart, but it's different. Does your heart break when you break the heart of God? Does it cause mourning and remorse and sorrow and grief? Because the the world paints deep sense of conviction, remorse, sorrow as bad. And really what what, what it actually is, is confession's just hard. Confronting sin is hard. But hear me, please, repentance is a gift. Repentance is a gift that we should open and unwrap multiple times a day. As many times as we need it, it is hard, but it is a gift. I heard this once and I wanted to give this to you to write down for a healthy view of repentance. There's four ingredients to repentance. Four ingredients to repentance, conviction of sin, contrition for sin, so feeling remorse, confession of sin, and confrontation of sin. All right, observation number two, only God is God. Yeah, I know, like I know I'm not God. We act like God every day. And we need the reminder often that we are not God. Only God is God. Only God is God. I love this first section. If you read from verses six on, it starts with this in this prayer and recounting all that God has done. It says, you are the Lord, you alone. And then they go on, you created the heavens. You created the seas and everything in it. You split the Red Sea for us. We didn't do that. You led us when we didn't know where to go. A cloud by day, fire by night. You fed us. You gave us water in the wilderness. Can I I tell you, if you feel like you're in a wilderness season, what this text reminds us is that regardless of whether you're not in the wilderness season, doesn't mean that you go without. Being in the wilderness does not mean that you go without. No, God gave over and over again, providing for them because that's who God is. These last couple of years have been really foundational for me, really digging into what do I actually believe? Why do I believe it? And something I've learned that's different from most things in this world is technology kind of advances as time goes on right? We get more and more advanced. We get more and more, and we are always at the apex of technology. It doesn't work like that in understanding the Bible. It doesn't work like that in, our, in, in how we view God. Why? Because we are moving further and further away from the time of Jesus where they sat and ate with God. And so what I believe it's doing in our culture, it is making us more prone to lose the awe and reverence God. I mean, the Israelite people wouldn't even say the word because of how much reverence and awe they had for God. I'm I'm saying, God, 
Like, that, I, I just don't, I'm, I, I, for me, I've lost that a little bit. I don't know about you, but it's, it's God, God who created the heavens and the earth, who flung the stars, who, who, who's created everything I hear, see, touch, smell. That's God. And I'm telling you, we've lost as a culture, as a church, as a nation, we have lost the awe and reverence of God like it used to be. It's God and only God is God. And it may even affect how you read the Bible. And so I'm here to remind you today, you are not the main character of this book. And and, and I I know it can be kind of comical, but we read the Bible like that. You ever come to the Bible and just like, man, I'm going through a hard time. I need something for me, 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 me. And we take everything and it's, it's about me, it's about me, no. This is God's story. (laughs) I'm not the main character in it. God, infinite in being, everywhere all the time. He's infinite in wisdom, infinite in power, omnipotent. He's infinite in holiness, justice, goodness. He's infinite in truth. He's eternal and he's unchangeable. I'm not infinite in anything. Nothing and no one is like God. Do you need wisdom? I bet you do. Go to the one who's infinite in wisdom. Do you need to know what's true in a world of confusion? Go to the one who created truth, is truth, and is infinite in truth. Are you feeling shaken by all that's going on in your life? Go to the one who's unchangeable, unshaken, and the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you need a miracle? I do. Go to the one who's infinite in power. How do I, how do I walk this out? How do I follow Jesus? How do I be holy and, and, and walk in holiness and justice and goodness? Well, Go to the one who's the greatest teacher the world has ever seen. Observation number three. God is always ready to forgive. God is always ready to forgive. Can you picture that? I picture it like this, just on the edge. Just, I'm here. I'm ready. The Israelites, which I hope you're realizing that we are very similar to the Israelites. They refused to obey, verse 17. They refused to obey. We're not mindful. We're not mindful of the wonders that God performed among them. That's a heavy one. I've been really challenged lately. I didn't say this in the last service, but really challenged lately with Proverbs chapter three, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Consider him. Other translations, think of him. In every decision to make, do you think about what he's thinking? I should be thinking, you know what I mean? God, what do you think about how I'm thinking about this? God, what do you think about this decision? What do you think about how I should come and talk to this person? Every single thing, be mindful of, they weren't mindful. They stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and did not forsake them. My wife and I, whenever we get in a a tiff, an argument, which in our four years of marriage has happened like uh, one or two times maybe, We do this thing where, you know, obviously at the end of every argument, we, you know, we try to, whoever wants to go first, (laughs) will you forgive me? Right? I forgive you. And if my dad were there, he'd make us hug, probably. Because that's what we did growing up. It's hard to be mad at somebody when you're hugging them. Amen? But we've been doing this thing where, um, 
when somebody asks, you know, will, will, you, will you forgive me? Sometimes an okay response for us that we've decided on is, I'm not ready yet. Because we want that statement, I, I forgive you, to mean what it actually means. Not to just say it with empty emptiness and still have bitterness in our heart. And so sometimes we take a little bit of time because I want, I want, I forgive you to be the powerful words that they are. But I'm reminded today through this text and hear me please, God is always ready. Always. He is always ready to forgive. Picture that. I, I mean, I think of the prodigal son, the, the father just on the lookout. And then once he saw his son, he ran. God is always ready to forgive. And that kind of acceptance, forgiveness, and love, that transforms us. Or at least it should. It should transform who we are and actually transform people should be changed people. And so it should change us. And I want to suggest today that the Christian should be the fastest to forgive. Christians should be the fastest to let go of bitterness. Christians should be the slowest to anger. Christians should be the first to say something when someone is going against somebody else. Christians should be the first people at some of this stuff. We should be the fastest because when we, why? Because we've received this absurd acceptance and forgiveness and love when we, just like the Israelites, did not deserve it and turn our back to God again and again and again and again. It should cause us to change. Last observation. God is really generous. toward the Israelites and to us. I like to highlight repeated words and you see it all throughout chapter nine. You gave them bread, verse 15. Verse 20, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. Verse 20, you gave them water. You gave their enemies into their hand and to a people who continually chose to turn their back. John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. Let's break this down. Let's, let, let's really dissect this passage. For God so loved the world. Okay, so that's, that's the motive. That's the fuel. God so loved the world. And the response, the outcome of that love, that he gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. May, this, may that never get old. That he gave his son Jesus. Jesus is a gift. And Jesus is a gift that we often neglect. God knew the Israelites would fail over and over and over again, just like us. How we fail over and over and over again. And I was thinking about this, it's just a crazy thought to me. It's one thing to give and expect nothing in return. It's a whole other thing when you're literally God and you know you're gonna get the opposite in return. So what did God do in response? I'm gonna get the opposite in return. They're gonna turn their back. They're gonna walk away. They're gonna throw the, 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 the right rules and the true laws and the good commandments. They're gonna throw them behind their back. What am I gonna do in response? I'm gonna give again. In the grand scope of things, just, just a few years later, he would give again, but it would be the last time because it's this ultimate sacrifice. He would give his son, Jesus. And the main takeaway for today 
from this passage, chapter nine, what we see in this text is really less about the Israelites, less about us, but it's really about what it points to. Because this text points to someone as they renew their pledge to be faithful to the covenant with God. What this points to is someone who would be the fulfiller of this law. It points to someone who could faithfully walk this out perfectly so that even though we wouldn't and we'd mess up and we'd fail like the Israelites and we turn our back and that we would have somebody to be our advocate and to be the bridge that gaps eternal separation. I always think about that through the light of Jesus, but I don't often think about the fact that what if Jesus hadn't come? What that would mean for us is eternal separation from the God who created us, loves us. That is a big gift. That is something that like, I hope I can continue to comprehend more and more of, but I know that I can't fully comprehend the gift that that is. And when we see it like this, God's generosity and his, and Jesus' obedience fueled by love in the midst of my rejection, it should provoke and cause a response. So what is our response to this? Well, it's one of two things. I either continue to choose my way or I fully submit in obedience under Christ, who is my savior, my master, and my Lord. It should cause us to devote everything and submit ourselves under the lordship of Christ. And the difference between them and us is the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit to empower us to walk in obedience. But hear me, that doesn't mean that there's no effort on my part because following God is not opposed to effort. Following God is hard work. But as we see in this text over and over again, as, as they recount how God has been faithful to them, it reminds us That following God is opposed to earning because they didn't earn any of it yet God gave and so as we close today with the main takeaway from this text. The obedience of Jesus made a way for me, made a way for you to be in relationship with God. I can't help but think of how I'm not walking in obedience in certain areas of my life. I, I, can't, I can't read this text and not think about, about the areas where I've chosen my way. I, I can't read this text and not think about the things that I have just not allowed God to be lordship in my life. Where I've not allowed him to be the Lord of my life, believing truly that he is the creator of life, knowing what's best for my life. I can't, I can't read this text and not think about that. And so what I want to ask us today, where in your life, where in my life, am I choosing my way over obedience to Christ? Where? Where in your life are you choosing your way over obedience to Christ. Can I tell you, he is worthy of giving and submitting 
It's not a fun word in our day and age, but submitting your life in obedience to Christ.